Number 1. Anna was last seen in McLeod, California on June 4, 1997. She left the residence of her boyfriend, Danny Rice, at approximately 10 p.m. to walk back to her own home. Hannah's house was located just a block or two away from Danny's residence at the time of her disappearance. She never arrived home and was never seen or heard from again afterwards. Hannah's mother, Jennifer Zaccaglini, wasn't initially concerned that her daughter hadn't returned home that night. She assumed Hannah had fallen asleep at Danny's residence. The next morning, however, Jennifer began to look for Hannah while Danny's mother filed a missing persons report. Investigators initially believed that Hannah left on her own accord. Her family and friends said she would never have run off from her home. She had a close relationship with her mother, and she made no indications of wanting to leave on her own. Jennifer said she last saw Hannah before she left to go to Danny's house, and she promised to be back by 10 p.m. Hannah also stopped by a friend's apartment for a cigarette and then went to Rice's residence. Rice broke up with Hannah because he and his family were moving to Nevada. Before Hannah began walking home, she bickered with Rice over some snapshot pictures she had given him of herself. She then began towards her home. Hannah stopped at the residence of Edward Ray at Henline and spoke with him for some time. He told investigators that Hannah and him spoke outside of his residence at the time. He stated that when he and her finished speaking, she began walking back home. Henline was reportedly the last person to see Hannah live that night. Investigators eventually concluded that Hannah did not leave voluntarily. Hannah did not take any personal possessions with her, such as her hairbrush, pocketbook, money, her beloved bass guitar, or her well-known getaway bag. In late June, police sought the assistance of the FBI in Hannah's missing persons case. Investigators questioned all of Hannah's friends and administered them to lie detector tests, but this led to nothing. How searches were also done, and the FBI questioned various town residents in relation to the case, but nothing conclusive came from any of this. Jennifer and Hannah's family has always believed that someone in McLeod had the information that would lead to Hannah's recovery. It was originally believed that Hannah had been abducted and was possibly being held against her will. There's no evidence that Hannah is currently living or that she was alive after the date she went missing. Hannah's disappearance had a profound impact on McLeod, and there hadn't been a recorded murder since 1984 by that time. Her disappearance shocked and haunted those who lived in the area, and her disappearance was the subject of much gossip by townsfolk. Investigators also questioned Hannah's father and her friends from Southern California, but none of them had heard from her since her disappearance. Ed Henline Sr. and his wife Debbie Henline acted odd in the days after Hannah's disappearance. Just a day after Hannah's disappearance, they asked to borrow Jennifer's van. They returned the van a few days later in pristine condition. They stated they cleaned it to thank her for allowing them to use it. This is considered odd since the Henlines were known for not being the most cleanest of people. A few days after that, Ed Henline was observed burning a perfectly good houseboat that he had dry docked in his backyard. Numerous search warrants were served, and the Henline residence has been searched various times, even with the help of utilized cadaver dogs. None of these searches ever turned up any trace of Hannah. Investigators believe the Henlines were involved in Hannah's case, as well as the disappearance of Karen Elizabeth Mitchell Miro. Karen was 27 years old when she disappeared from the same area as Hannah on February 15, 1997. Her parents stated they last saw her at the Henline residence during that month. They stated they began to feel concerned in May of 1997, when she hadn't contacted them, and her 28th birthday passed. Karen's parents attempted to file a missing persons report for her, but were told that she was an adult and could leave whenever she pleased. Karen also had a warrant out for her arrest, so it was assumed she had gone into hiding. Investigators finally accepted a report on October 16, 1997. Karen had gotten a liver transplant in 1994 and required anti-rejection medications. She has not refilled her medication since her disappearance. In November of 1997, authorities cancelled Miro's medical disability money, but she still hasn't contacted anyone. Investigators believe she is deceased because without her medication, she wouldn't be able to survive for long. She was allegedly dating Ed Henline Jr. at the time of her disappearance. He was the son of Ed Sr. and Debbie. Investigators considered the Henlines possible suspects in both cases, and still do. They have been the main focus of the investigation due to their strange behavior in both cases. It should be noted that they have been uncooperative in the investigation into both disappearances. In 1998, both Ed and Debbie were arrested for welfare fraud. They evidently were continuing to cash Karen's disability checks for months after her disappearance in February. They were both ordered to pay a $2,000 fine and serve three years probation. No developments were made after this break, and Hannah's missing persons case became cold. On June 23, 2012, the sheriff's office reopened the investigation into Hannah's disappearance. They now believe that Hannah was murdered on the night of her disappearance. 
On November 15, 2012, Ed Henlein Sr. was arrested and charged with Hannah's presumed murder. Then on November 17, 2012, Ed Henlein Jr. was also arrested and charged with conspiracy and accessory to commit a crime. It's believed that both men were involved in Hannah's presumed death. Ed Sr. was charged with first-degree murder and accessory to commit a crime. Investigators felt they had finally cracked the case and would be able to have the responsible convicted for killing Hannah. In May of 2013, however, the county's district attorney dropped the charges related to Hannah's murder due to lack of evidence. They stated that without Hannah's body, they had little to no evidence against Ed Sr. and Ed Jr. Investigators have stated that they will never stop searching for both Hannah and Karen. They believe there are other people in McLeod who know what happened to Hannah and Karen but aren't talking. There is currently a $2,500 $5,000 reward for any information that leads to a conviction in either Hannah or Karen's cases. At the time of her disappearance, Hannah was a student at McLeod High School, and the school year was near ending. Those close to her have stated she would never leave on her own. Hannah's parents were divorced, and Hannah had moved with her mother and two siblings from Los Angeles back to McLeod in 1996. Hannah and her family lived in a two-bedroom house which was just a few houses away from Jennifer's parents' house and across the street from McLeod Elementary School. Hannah was one of 100 teenagers who attended the high school, and her friends recalled she would joke about being elected sophomore homecoming princess because the few other girls in her class refused the crown. Hannah learned to play bass guitar in the school rock and roll band in the winter. Her mother worked as a waitress and cook at the Brie Arpich restaurant, but they had lost most of their house utilities by the time Hannah disappeared. Hannah played Santana and Beatles tunes on bass in a school concert just the night before her disappearance. She was looking forward to a gig at the Siskiyou Golden Fair State Grounds in Eureka. Hannah was also a school cheerleader and an aspiring model in 1997. Hannah's disappearance remains unsolved, and foul play is suspected in the case. Her family continues to search for answers in her case. Karen Miro's mother is also still alive and hopes to find out what happened to her daughter. Authorities have openly stated that murder charges can be brought against both henlines again if evidence is found. Jennifer has stated the police were prejudiced against her and initially didn't investigate the case as thoroughly as they should have. Number 2. Vanessa was last seen in Winton, California on May 31, 1997. She left her residence on Mercedes Avenue at approximately 7 p.m. that evening to take a walk along her neighborhood near an almond orchard. This was something that Vanessa did often and she usually went with her mother, Beverly Smith. This time, however, Vanessa went alone. She never returned home and was never seen or heard from again. After she was discovered as missing, Vanessa's walking stick was discovered 200 yards east of her house. No other trace was ever found of her. Investigators initially believed Vanessa possibly ran away, but this is immensely discounted. Vanessa left behind her purse which contained her savings, and she also left behind her cherished watch at home. Vanessa also gave no indication of wanting to leave. Beverly believes Vanessa was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Investigators and her believe Vanessa was abducted by someone she knew and was associated with at the time of her disappearance. Despite this, investigators haven't publicly identified any suspects in her disappearance, and no arrests have been in the case. Beverly agrees it's possible that Vanessa was possibly drugged and sexually abused after her disappearance. She along with many others believe that Vanessa is still alive and will one day return home. In 2019, an elderly couple came forward and stated they saw Vanessa walking that evening. The couple were going to a residence where a vehicle was for sale. On their way, they drive on Mercedes Avenue and observed a young teenage girl with a stick in hand. They stated they thought nothing of it at the time. They were asked if they had seen any other vehicles coming the opposite way, but they saw nothing. They arrived at the residence and waited there for about 10 to 15 minutes. They then took an opposing way home. The couple believed they encountered the individual involved in Vanessa's disappearance while on their way home. The couple stated they never told anyone of what they saw because they feared retaliation and didn't want to get involved in general. Investigators have received the information and are looking over it. Investigators do receive some tips on the case, but nothing substantial has ever come from them. Vanessa's case is remembered by many residents of Winton, and various community members have shown everlasting support for Beverly and the search for her daughter. Vanessa's case has been profiled on America's Most Wanted, and her poster has been shared all around. At the time of her disappearance, Vanessa was described as a very laid-back person and loved to be around people. She had just graduated the eighth grade at Grace Mennonite School the day before her disappearance and attended a school picnic on the day she disappeared until 5 p.m. Vanessa had big plans for the summer, she and a friend were going to take sewing classes, and she was going to Colorado for two weeks in August to visit a friend. Vanessa's disappearance remains unsolved, and foul play is suspected in her case. 
Investigators believe someone in Winton knows what happened to Vanessa and who was involved, and they urge anyone with information to come forward. It's also believed that Vanessa may still be somewhere in the local area, her father stated that she would never go anywhere without permission. She had dreams of working in an office, having foster children, and owning a Honda. Number 3. Aaron was last seen in Atlanta, Georgia on September 14, 1980. During the day he went missing, Darren got onto the church bus to go and attend an Atlanta Braves game in the downtown area. Darren got back onto the bus which drove him to the area his home was located in, and he got dropped off at the corner of Glenwood Avenue Southeast and 2nd Avenue Southeast. Darren returned to his residence for a few minutes at 4 p.m. and the left again. His foster mother, Fannie Mae Smith, stated she assumed Darren was going out to play. He never returned home and was never seen again. A few hours after his disappearance, Fanny received an emergency call from Darren Glass, but the caller hung up before Fanny could speak. There was never another call. Darren has never been heard from since then. Investigators believe Darren was possibly murdered and was the victim of the infamous Atlanta child murderer, who claimed over 28 victims from July 21, 1979, to May 21, 1981. The victim's age ranged from 7 to 28, and were mostly boys who came from poverty. Some of the victims remained missing persons for over several months to a year before they would be found. The victims' remains were found in rivers, under brush, or in an alley. Darren is the only possible victim of the killings that remains missing. The murders shocked the entire city of Atlanta, and over 100 agents were involved in the investigation. Curfews were imposed, and parents even took their children out of school and forbid them to play outside. Investigators felt that the next victim of the killer would be dumped in a body of water to conceal evidence of the crime. Police staked out nearly a dozen bridges which included crossings of the Chattahoochee River. A break in the case would come on May 22, 1981, during a police stakeout of the bridges. One officer heard a splash underneath the bridge. Another officer saw a white 1970 Chevrolet station wagon turn around and drive across the bridge. Two police officers later stopped the suspected vehicle. Inside was a man named Wayne Bertram Williams. Williams was a music promoter and a freelance photographer at the time of the murders. The Chevrolet belonged to his parents at the time. He was brought in for questioning, and he told investigators he was on his way to audition a woman, Cheryl Johnson, as a singer. Williams told authorities she lived in the nearby town of Smyrna. Police found no evidence of this woman which weakened Williams' alibi. Two days later, the body of Nathaniel Cater was found floating downriver a few miles from the bridge where police heard the splash and saw the vehicle driving away. He was 27 years old at the time of his death. Based on this evidence, investigators suspected Williams threw Nathaniel's body into the river while police were nearby. Authorities who stopped Williams in his vehicle on the bridge noticed there were gloves and a 24-inch nylon cord sitting in the passenger seat. Investigators noted the cord looked similar to one used in Cater's murder and some of the other victims of the killings. The cord was never taken for evidence analysis, however. Williams also apparently failed the FBI-administered polygraph exam. Investigators discovered that fibers which came from a carpet in Williams' residence were found to match ones that were observed on two of the victims. Additional fibers from Williams' home, vehicles, and his pet dog were observed on some of the other victims of the slayings. A witness also reportedly saw Williams holding hands with Nathaniel Cater on the night he is believed to have been killed. On June 21, 1981, Williams was arrested and charged with Crater's murder and the murder of Jimmy Ray Payne, who was 22 when he died. The presiding judge at his trial in 1982 allowed for evidence to be brought in which allegedly linked him to several of the victims. He was eventually convicted of killing Cater and Payne, and is suspected of killing four of the other victims based on evidence. After Williams was convicted, police closed the cases of the 22 other victims and concluded that Williams also killed them. Despite this, there is immense doubt regarding Williams' guilt in the cases. Many suspect that the Atlanta child killer was actually several killers operating independently. The Ku Klux Klan has been considered a possibility, but nothing has been proven. One of the police officers on the task force who arrested Williams even said he didn't believe Williams had killed anyone. Despite this, Williams remains in prison and all of his appeals have been denied. He continues to maintain his innocence. In 2004, investigators reopened the cases of some of the Atlanta child killer victims, but the investigation was closed once again in 2006, after nothing new was found. The cases were reopened again in March of 2019, and investigators hope to find out who killed the other victims, or if Williams is truly innocent of the murders he has been accused of. It should be noted, however, that Darren is only listed as a possible victim of the killings due to his age and the time he went missing. It's possible, however, that Darren's remains were found years after his disappearance when someone tipped police that the remains of two victims could be found in a specific location. Investigators found one body and identified the remains afterwards. 
Another body was found much later, but the identity could not be confirmed. It's possible these are Darren's remains, but nothing has come about them. Fanny Smith described Darren as a streetwise kid, but also immature as well. She said he was very quiet and loved to watch TV. He used to bring his friends over to the house for Kool-Aid and fried chicken, and he was known to love popcorn. Fanny even recalled how Darren would pretend to be a ladies' man. He lived at 2289 Memorial Drive SE in 1980. It's possible Darren ran away from home, but it's unclear if he had a history of doing so. Some agencies claim Darren was habitual runaway who had run away three to four times before his actual disappearance in 1980. Other agencies claim he didn't have a history of doing so. Fanny also stated Darren liked to stay close to home. He lived with another foster family about a year before moving in with Fanny. Darren's biological parents were both deceased at the time of his 1980 disappearance. This made him a ward of the state. He did have a sister who lived on East Lake Drive and a daddy uncle who lived off Flat Shoals Road. His sister was living out of state at the time of his disappearance. According to Darren's caseworker, Thomas Bailey, his foster placement with Fanny Smith was quite unsuitable. Bailey went on to stated that there were adults of questionable character in the house, along with suspicion of drug use and selling. Bailey stated he voiced his concerns about the placement with his supervisor, but was ignored on the subject. Bailey stated he found out about Darren's disappearance the day after it occurred. This was on September 15, 1980. That same day, Bailey apparently got a phone call from a woman who claimed to be Darren's sister. Darren did nothing have contact with his sister at the time. Bailey stated the caller told him she wanted to adopt Darren. Bailey told her that Darren was missing and the caller hung up. She never contacted him again. One of Darren's foster brothers claimed to have known his whereabouts and that he had received phone calls from Darren until as late as November of 1980. This information was never verified, however. There were also various sightings of Darren after his reported disappearance. Based on this, Bailey believes Darren was not murdered and was possibly taken by someone he knew or that he went to live with his sister. Bailey believes Darren possibly died later in life or that he may still be alive and living with a relative or in an assisted living facility. Darren remains missing and his case unsolved. Investigators have never clawed his missing person's case and continue to seek his whereabouts. Foul play is suspected. In 2015, Bailey published a book about Darren's disappearance, it's called Darren. The Disappearance of Darren Glass. Number 4. Pace was last seen in Milan, Tennessee on August 16, 1996. On the night of her disappearance, she attended a back-to-school party at the Double Springs Cumberland Presbyterian Church. At approximately 12.30 a.m., a family friend, Pam King, drove Case home. Her residence was located on U.S. Highway 45 at the time of her disappearance. Pam said Case walked up to front door and waved before walking in. No lights were on inside. Case was never seen or heard from again after she got home. Her mother, Cindy McDaniel, and her longtime boyfriend returned home from a party at approximately 2.45 a.m. They noticed that the back door of the home was open. Case's clothes that she wore to the church were found in her bedroom along with the rest of her personal belongings. There was also a bowl of cookies and a glass of milk on the floor of her bedroom, and the television was turned on. There was no indication of where Case had gone at the time. It appeared as though she dressed in her night clothing and left her residence. Cindy was initially unconcerned by her daughter's absence, Case was known to spend the night at a friend's house often, so she naturally assumed this is what happened. The next day, Cindy called all of Case's friends and family, only to find that no one had seen her since the party. Cindy filed a missing persons report with the police after this. When police visited the residence, they found no obvious signs of foul play, they initially suspected Case may have run away from her home. Case was not a very troublesome child. She was somewhat rebellious at the time of her disappearance and was known to have previously smoked cigarettes and also dated an 18-year-old boy. Her family has stated she would never leave and not contact them again. After weeks of not receiving any contact from Case, her family and the police began to suspect the worst. Investigators believe that Case was abducted by persons, unknown while she was by herself at her home. There were reported sightings of Case with an unidentified man in the days after her presumed abduction. The first of the sightings occurred just the day after her apparent abduction. One August 17, Case was seen at the Gibson County Fair with an older white male. On August 24, a witness reportedly saw Case at the Dyersburg Walmart, and she was again accompanied by an unknown male subject. On August 28, investigators compiled and released a sketch of the man who is considered a possible suspect in Case's disappearance. The man was described as being Caucasian and appeared to have a dark complexion. He appeared to be in his early twenties in 1996, and he had dark colored eyes and hair. He stood at 603 and weighed approximately 170 pounds. The man had a distinctive scar underneath his right eye, and he had an earring in his right ear. 
This man remains unidentified and it's unknown if the girl seen with him was truly Case or not. Investigators and her family have spent years searching for her. Local ponds were searched as well as wooded areas. Investigators even acted on the tip of a psychic, Dorothy Allison. She stated Case was located in a place with a pond, a zoo, fallen trees, and a picnic area. This led to a search of a five-acre pond in 1998. No evidence was found in the search. Investigators also utilized a cadaver dog from Mountain Wilderness Search Dogs of Oregon was used at yet another pond in the Milan area. The dog did alert to the scent of human remains at the pond, and investigators yielded articles of clothing. The clothing did not belong to Case, but to another missing person. There were many possible suspects in the case over the years. Rumors went around as well about the case. Cindy was initially a suspect after an inconclusive polygraph test. There was a rumor that she owed money in drug debt and that her daughter was abducted by whoever she owed money to. Cindy denied the allegations and is no longer a suspect. Cindy received an anonymous phone call which stated that an unidentified truck was spotted in the driveway of the residence at 12.30 a.m. that night. Investigators looked into the tip but found no evidence or the truck. They also received a tip that someone had seen Case's body floating in the river, but no body was ever found. Investigators also looked at Case's boyfriend, Charlie. He was in prison at the time for unclear reasons, but he had no involvement in her disappearance. In September of 1996, investigators named Charles B. Sullivan as a possible suspect in the case. He was being held on aggravated burglary charges and aggravated rape. The victim in that case was a woman from Davidson County. Milan police traveled to Nashville to question Sullivan. He was also considered a suspect in at least nine other cases besides cases at the time. He allegedly matched the description of the unidentified man seen with Case at the Gibson County Fair and the Dyersburg Walmart. A cadaver dog was brought to his home to search, but no evidence was found in the search. For many years, investigators attempted to narrow down the list of suspects they had in Case's case. Almost all of the suspects had alibis that checked out, all except one. That suspect's name is Finnis Ewan Pete Hill 3. He was a friend of both Cindy and her boyfriend in 1996. He also knew Case, and she even called him Uncle Pete. Hill attended the party that Cindy and her boyfriend were at during the night of Case's disappearance. He left as soon as they arrived, Cindy stated he did this because he was angry at her. He apparently made sexual advances towards her, but she refused to have sexual intercourse with him. Investigators believe he went to the residence hoping to find Cindy there, but instead found Case home alone. Cindy says her daughter would have trusted Hill enough to let him inside the house. Hill's wife initially provided him with an alibi for that night, but later recanted it and confirmed it was false. He has been a suspect since the early investigation. In July of 2018, Hills was named as the primary suspect in Case's presumed abduction and likely slaying. In 2004, Hill was convicted of attempting to abduct a woman at gunpoint while she was washing her car. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison and was released in 2018. Shortly after his release, Hills began talking online to a girl whom he believed was underage. This was actually an undercover cop. Hills and the cop talked for months and agreed under the pretense to have sexual intercourse. Hills traveled to Mississippi to do this and was promptly arrested. When he was taken into custody, investigators found sex toys, drugs, condoms, and alcohol inside his vehicle. He has also previously bragged of having sex with a 14-year-old girl. On October 18, 2019, while Hills was in federal prison, he was charged with cases rape and murder. He was indicted on two counts of first-degree murder and two counts of aggravated rape. Investigators believe he used a weapon to force Case out of her house and into his vehicle. He allegedly took steps to conceal and hide her body. Hill is currently awaiting trial in Case's case. At the time of her disappearance, Case was described as a normal teenage girl who got straight A's in middle school and was good at algebra. Her best friend stated she was excited about going into high school. She was also an honors student as well. She was also active in youth group activities like the dance she attended that night. She was described by those she knew as lovable. Her body has never been found. Number 5. Lee was last seen in Revere, Massachusetts on April 7, 1974. At the time he went missing, Lee would shine shoes after school to earn pocket money. During the week, Lee had been grounded for falling behind in math, he was getting bad grades. His mother, Dolores, said that Lee came to ask her if he could resume shoe shining on the day of his disappearance. Dolores said she felt bad for him, so she allowed him to do so. At 11 a.m., Lee left his residence located on State Road. He was intending to shine shoes at his usual place which was the Suffolk Downs and near the racetrack. The Downs was located next to his residence. He stopped at a diner at Beachmont Square for a sandwich and a glass of milk. Lee asked the owner of the establishment to watch over his shoe sign kit while he left and said he was going to the beach. He said he would be back shortly, but he never returned to the diner. 
Dolores became worried when Lee hadn't returned by 3 p.m., so she attempted to file a missing persons report with police. They told her she had to wait a few hours before they could take a report. Dolores did not want to wait and began searching the neighborhood for Lee. At 4 p.m., the owner of the diner gave Dolores her son's shoe shine kit. Lee has never been seen or heard from since. Investigators strongly suspect he was abducted by a non-family member. Searches which took place by police and others after his disappearance turned up no sign of him. Dolores and Lee's father, Lowell, believes someone from the racetrack lured Lee and took him from the area. Dolores believes whoever took her son possibly killed him as well. They are confident in this idea, but investigators have not named any strong suspects in Lee's case. In 2001, Massachusetts authorities considered the possibility that Lee may have been a victim of serial killer Nathaniel Barjona. Barjona has been linked to a dozen missing children cases and sexual assault cases that go as far back as the 1970s. Barjona was believed to be involved in cannibalism and possibly ate some of his victims. Barjona is considered a suspect in the 1973 Connecticut disappearance of Janice Pocket and the 1978 Massachusetts disappearance of Andrew Amato. He was also previously charged with the 1996 abduction and murder of Zachary Ramsey, who went missing from Montana in 1996. His body was never found. He's also been mentioned in the 1997 Wyoming case of Amanda Gallion. Barjona died of a blood clot while in prison for sexual assault in 2008. There's no evidence that he was involved in Lee's presumed abduction, but due to the timing and location, he has been considered. Investigators believe it's possible Lee's disappearance is connected to a sexual assault case that occurred later in the year of Lee's disappearance. In September of 1974, nine-year-old Cliff Bassano was accompanied by three friends as he sold used racing programs near the tea shop. Pisano and his friends were approached by a man in a white car, who asked if one of them could clean his car for $10. Pisano ended up going with him, and the man reportedly took him to a remote area that looked over Logan Airport. He remembers the man dragging him on the rocks. Pisano was sexually assaulted, beaten, and eventually left for dead. Pisano survived his attack was found the next day by a man. Pisano was seriously injured and spent five weeks in a coma fighting for his life. He got out of the hospital a few months after the attack. Pisano's assailant was eventually apprehended and charged with the crime. Pisano testified against a man who was found guilty of the crime and sentenced to prison time for it. Pisano says he wasn't even aware the Lee had disappeared that same year. There wasn't much media exposure to his case at the time. Investigators in Lee's case are aware of the attack on Pisano and the man who was eventually arrested for the crime. It's unclear whether the individual is a suspect in Lee's abduction or not. Investigators have stated they haven't ruled out foul play or anything else in Lee's disappearance. At the time of his disappearance, Lee was a third-grade student at Louis Pasteur School in 1974. His mother said he was a good student. Lee is one of seven siblings. He was saving up pocket money in order to buy Dolores an Easter present at the time. Dolores and Lowell have never stopped searching for him and hold on to hope that he's still alive. Lee's disappearance remains unsolved.